Hi everyone for coming out, despite the cold. Usually when I leave Canada at this time of the year, I expect to go to somewhere where it's warmer, but it's as cold here as it is in Waterloo. So from this point of perspective, this trip did not work out, but the workshop is great, so there's something positive here. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about our recent work on um, off-chain payments or credit networks. And um, I'm going to keep the motivation pretty short because you probably heard similar motivations today several times. Namely, that blockchains have the issue that they tend to be pretty slow and they have a really low throughput. So if you try to use them as global transaction networks, let's have a short look at the actual numbers. If you're looking at the number of, bit of transactions that the Bitcoin blockchain manages at the moment, in terms of measurements, we're up to seven transactions a second. Comparing that to something like the Visa network, they manage close to 60,000 transactions a second. And maybe you can do some nice tricks to make Bitcoin a bit faster, but you see, you probably won't get around the three to four orders of magnitude that we have. So what can we do instead? What are alternative solutions to doing um, payments? Well, one idea is what in the context of the Lightning Network is called payment channels. And the idea here is that we have two users, let's call them A and B, and they agree up in a channel with a total capacity of X plus Y. Then they divide the uh, capacity in the sense that at the current state in this example, A can send up to X, let's say, bitcoins to B. And on the other hand, y can send, uh, b can send up to y bitcoins to a. Now what happens if a actually sends something? Well, let's say a sends set bitcoins, then the payment channel changes, and now the value from x a to b will be x minus z, and the value from b to y will be y plus z. So this is pretty straightforward, and this step can usually be managed in such a way that you do not need the blockchains to do this type of a transaction. So you don't need to, uh, need to have an additional transaction on the blockchain, you can do it locally. So what type of networks are we talking about that use this type of transactions? Well, what I explained right now is um, the Lightning Network, or is a rough approximation of it which is this add-on for Bitcoin that makes, uh, helps making Bitcoin more scalable. Actually, when we started this project, we weren't so much thinking about the Lightning Network because that was um, late 2016 and that was still kind of future work. But rather the work that I'm introducing is very, solves a rather general problem that relates to the Lightning Network, but it's also of interest for something like Interledger. Maybe you heard um, Evan Swartz talk this morning about um, Interledger, which tries to make payments between different blockchains, and there you will run into similar problems. You need to have some sort of channel on how to get from one blockchain to another one. And one of the, another system that has um, similar types of channels is a credit network, like Silent Whispers, and here the idea is that we are leveraging something like your local connections. You're willing to give your friend up to $10 credit and the friend might be willing to give another friend up to $20 credit. And then you can do payments leveraging this type of credit relations. What all these type of networks have in common is that they don't stop at the point of having this one payment channel. They're also interested in the fact, what happens if I have a sender of a payment and I have a recipient? And the two do not share a payment channel, maybe because it's too expensive to set up, maybe because they do not have the necessary real-world trust relationship to set it up. What you can do is that the sender can nevertheless pay the recipient is use some intermediate nodes. So in this case, you have one intermediate node that has a payment channel with both the sender and the recipient. And then you can forward a payment of value five from the sender to the recipient. And for the intermediate node that is forwarding the payment, the 
total incoming balance and outgoing balance does not change, just the way that it is distributed over the channels changes by forwarding this payment. Now this looks interesting, and it is, uh, seems rather straightforward if you, you have one intermediate node. However, imagine that you have a really large scale network with, with several thousands or even millions of nodes, and you try to find these intermediate nodes for doing the payment. Well, this seems a bit harder. How do we find good routes for routing these type of payments in a large scale network? So this is what this talk will be about. We will not be looking into any specific network. We will not be talking about the exact effects of payment channels in the context of Lightning or Interledger or anything else. We will be looking at a problem that all of them have in common, which is finding these multi-hop payment routes in a large scale system. And as motivated in the last talk, if you want to do payments, you're always interested in privacy because usually we're not really happy with having your, our complete transaction history for everyone on the web to read. So I'm going to first talk a bit about privacy goals. Then I'm going to introduce you to our routing algorithm, so our algorithm for finding these type of routes in a large-scale distributed network. We're going to do a quick privacy evaluation and an evaluation of the performance and scalability based on real-world data set. So let's start with our privacy goals. We've got a paper, had a paper at NDSS associated with this, and there we have actual formal definitions of the privacy goals. In the interest of time, for this talk, I'm going to give you an intuition of what our privacy goals are that is not formalized. On a very high level, what you want to hide is you want to hide how much is who sending to whom. So the first concept of interest is value privacy. Value privacy essentially means if I'm an adversary who wants to break the privacy of the users and I'm not involved in a payment, then I cannot say how much was actually paid. So what was the value of the payment? The second aspect I'm interested in is sender or receiver privacy. You might also call that anonymity. So again, we have a malicious node who tries to figure out who is the sender of a payment and who is the recipient. And even if this malicious node is on the payment pass, the malicious node should not be able to uniquely identify the sender and the recipient. Because we're sending payments in a certain direction, the node can tell, OK, the payment is coming from here, and it's going from here to here. But it cannot uniquely say who is the actual sender and who will be the recipient. Now, these are our goals with regard to privacy. Let's look into our solution. How do we route these payments in such a way that we have efficiency, but also have these type of privacy guarantees? So I'll introduce Speedy Murmurs. Speedy Murmurs is our protocol for privacy preserving and scalable routing in using payment channels. And the main idea is you now have these, this network of payment channels. And to make this a bit less chaotic uh, for this graph, I just left out all the numbers and represented everything as a bidirectional link. So what are we doing? We're having this type of network topology, and the first step is use your favorite distributed spanning tree construction algorithm to come up with a spanning tree. The spanning tree is a rooted spanning tree, so we have a root node. In the next step, what we're doing is we assign coordinates to all the nodes in the network based on their position in the spanning tree. And these then facilitate routing. If that sounds a bit abstract, don't worry. I'm now giving you an example that shows you it's actually really simple. We start with the root node of the tree, and we're using vector-based coordinates, so the root gets the empty vector as a coordinate. Now what happens next is that each uh, um, remaining node in the tree will take the parent coordinate and an enumeration index. 
So what the root node will do, it will enumerate its children with one and two. So the first coordinates here are the vector one and the vector two. Then the children of the node with coordinate one get the coordinates one, one, and the coordinate one, two. And the last node in the tree gets the coordinate one to one. So it's essentially simply enumerating a spanning tree. And based on these coordinates, you can now define a distance function between the nodes in the trees based on um, what the coordinates look like. And to be specific, the distance function is the summary of the vector lengths minus twice the common prefix lengths. And the common prefix lengths is the number of initial elements those vectors have in common. But regardless of how it looks like, the intuition of this distance is merely, this is the number of green edges I have to walk to get from one node to another in the spanning tree. And how can I now use this? Well, I now have a distance. And if I, as um, a forwarding node, get the coordinate of the recipient, I can forward it towards nodes that are closer to where I want to go. And in general, I do not only use one of those spanning trees, but I use multiple of these spanning trees. Why do I use multiple of these spanning trees? Well, maybe be because I cannot find one pass that has enough funds to do my payment, but I might be able to combine several paths so that the sum of the payments adds up to the value that I actually want to send. So this is why I'm doing several of these spanning trace. So how do I actually conduct the payment now? The payment is conducted in two steps. The first preparation step is done by the sender. Let's say we have a sender and a recipient, and the sender wants to send a fund, amount of fund that is C. It has the opportunity to use up to T pass to do that. So the first thing that the sender does is divide the total value into t smaller values, and the eth value represents um, the amount that I want to send using the eth spanning tree. Now, after deciding upon this value, you can send um, the actual, you can do the sending on each of the spanning trees, and each node along the path that decides. Um, whom do I forward a payment to? Who is the next node on the pass? will take the following points into consideration. It will look at its neighbors, and it knows both the coordinates and the amounts of funds that are available on the payment channel. So what it will do, it will select neighbors that are closer to the receiver with regard to the node coordinate, and on the other hand, you need to be able to send at least the amount CI via the link, because otherwise um, you could not satisfy the payment using this link. And if there are several of those neighbors, you would simply choose the one that is closest to the destination. And if you look at this example, here we're having a payment of um, value five, so this would be forwarded towards the root node because that's the only payment channel with a sufficient value. So this is the key idea of how the routing algorithm works. There are a couple of details that I excluded for the time being. Let's look into our privacy goals. Remember, we had two privacy goals. The first one was value privacy. We wanted to make sure that the transaction value C is hidden from all the adversaries that are not involved in the payment. And indeed, that's obvious from the construction algorithm. We only communicate with the nodes on the path. If we're using secure channels and encrypt everything, then we're good. The interesting case is what happens if we have an adversarial node that is on the path? Well, this node obviously learns something about the transaction value, and it can estimate the value that um, we will be sending. So for example, if the adversarial node observes a value of five and knows that there are two of those spanning trees. It knows that likely the transaction had a value of 
um, in expectation the transaction had a value of 10, and it can even uh, compute a probability distribution of what the most likely transaction value was. However, it does not learn the actual value only by being on one pass. The second goal that we had was hiding the identity of the sender and um, the receiver of the payment. Luckily, in this case, these type of um, coordinates assignments have been used for um, messaging and peer-to-peer -peer systems in the past, and we could simply use the algorithm that was originally designed to provide anonymity in this context. So we're simply using this for our speedy murmurs. This closes the privacy evaluation. Um, the next step is doing a performance evaluation. For this purpose, we crawled information from Ripple, which is a credit network, and um, got some real-world data on what these type of networks might look like. So we have a test graph with roughly 60,000 nodes, and we also have more than 300,000 transactions that we could use for testing, where we know the sender and the recipient. On this information, we then um, tested on the one hand speedy murmurs, which is our protocol, but also silent whispers, which was the state-of-the-art protocol for this type of transactions before. And last, Fort Fulkerson, because you might have realized what we're solving is essentially a flow problem, so we're using the standard traditional flow algorithm. Looking at um, the success ratio, so how many of the possible transactions could al our algorithm actually find? Fort Fulkerson can generally uh, solve a flow problem if a solution exists, so we have a success ratio of 1. Our algorithm Speedy Murmurs only has about 90%. But you might remember from des describing the protocol, in this first step, um, the sender has to divide the uh, payment randomly. So if the payment fails, the sender can simply divide it in a different manner and try again. And we're more than 25% better than silent whispers, which only had a success ratio of roughly 65%. Still, looking at this figure, we should take Fort Fulkerson, right? It's by far the most successful in solving these transactions. However, remember our goal is we want to have a scalable, large-scale transaction networks with a lot of throughput in a very short time. So let's have a short look on how many messages do we need to actually conduct such a payment. And again, the same algorithms, and the y-axis tells you how many messages do I need. So that does not look so good for Fort Fulkerson. Or to d take it and say it in actual numbers, Fort Fulkerson needs roughly 50,000 transactions, uh, messages on average to do one transaction in this type of networks. If you look at our protocol, Speedy Murmurs, we're down to 15 messages for one transaction on average. So with regard to which works better in a large-scale scalable network, obviously you would rather go with speedy murmurs. And if you're looking at the state-of-the-art silent whispers, it still needs like a factor for more messages than our new protocol. So to summarize, I introduced you to speedy murmurs, an approach for off um, chain transactions, and I'm mainly focused on our novel embedding-based routing protocol. If you look in the actual paper, we also talked a bit about how do you deal with network dynamics, how do you change the coordinates if um, the payment channels change or if the participants change. And another aspect here is, of course, what if you have several concurrent transactions going on at the same time? How do you deal with the fact that you have would likely have to satisfy several of them. And we figured, doing our evaluation, we figured out that our protocol is effective in the sense that we had a pretty high success ratio on finding routes. It's efficient with regard to having a low number of messages. It's scalable because it scales logarithmically in the number of nodes in the network. 
and we achieve key privacy goals. And again, let me remind you that this was a very high level idea that is applicable to a lot of protocols, one of them being the Lightning Networks. And one more point that might be interesting if you got interested into this type of works and want to test it out. We made this real world data set that we gathered from Ripple and Cleaned, as well as our simulation code, where you can easily play around with the algorithm and um, change it if you want to try something new, publicly available. And this was it from me. I'm not sure if there are time for questions, probably not. No. <laughs>